Let me have one for Stefan and then one for the authors. Um, Stefan, hindsight bias, really interesting. Um, DFID's entire disaster response policy was essentially failing around hindsight bias, essentially because there was a 10% rule that disaster response finance could be invested in disaster risk reduction, which was almost all spent in the area where the disaster had just happened, preparing for that disaster potentially to happen in the future. Yes. Um, I wondered what your thoughts were on that, and whether or not within DFID this, is, this has been kind of chewed over as a kind of a lost decade in some sense. Uh, and then secondly, to, to Rasmus, really interesting the issues of kind of political economy and comparing spending before disasters compared to spending after it. Does that mean that the bank statistics of $1 spent in preparation saves $5 or $7 or whatever number we're on now in, in relief actually just make no sense at all and we need to restart the discussion? That's great. Thanks very much. That was um, Tom Mitchell from ODI. Could other speakers please introduce themselves before they kick in? No, thanks. Great points, Tom. Any other? Anyone else with you? Thank you. Debbie Hillier from Oxfam. Um, it's a really interesting report, so thank you for that. Um, just wanted to raise one quite sort of small question. I'm interested in the preparation for risk index that was done as part of this, and I'm wondering whether this could be part of the uh, post-MDGs discussion. So there's been lots of discussion about a resilience target or goal or indicators, and I'm wondering whether this could be at least a, a possibility for, for that whole debate and whether you'd thought that through any more. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. Okay, if there are another, if you're all still contemplating what the next question is, then I'll, I'll go back to the panel at this point because there was, I think, also plenty for Rasmus and Kyla in the discussion's comments as well. Rasmus, do you want to sure. check off? Sure. Okay, great. <coughs> uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, wonderful and challenging discussion. It's, I, I always, um, I was really looking forward to coming here to ODI bec because I, I knew the, uh, the the discussion would be would be fun and challenging, and uh, with, with such um, uh, given the wealth of experience here, uh, but also uh, it's nice. It's really nice to, to to have this discussion today because ODI actually uh, contributed a couple of uh, really important background papers. Um, so, so we see that um, you know, we feel that there are lots of limits to insurance, whether it's market insurance, Alison, or, or, or informal insurance. There's lots of limitations, and as there are to any one risk management instrument. So it's not a thing that one instrument, one tool will, will sort of solve it, right? We need a comprehensive approach, we need one that's systematic, and we need, need one that, that's proactive. Uh, and yes, of course, there are risks of action. There are risks of doing something wrong. But there are also risks of inaction. And, and we, we address that very much in the, in the chapter on the role of the international community, where a lot of donors are very risk averse. And uh, they, need save, they need results to show to, to taxpayers, obviously. <coughs> and, and so they, they, there's this tendency to take on relatively safe projects, relatively safe countries. And to um, where some of the really difficult challenges um, in, fra in conflict and fragile affected uh, countries, including right, that that maybe maybe donors shy a little bit away there. Just just so, so the, the the risk of, of of inaction is that these problems can blow up. So we actually encourage donors to be to take more risks. So 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 so, so the issue is 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 to do it in a in a in a smart way. Um, which very much has to do with communicating the risks that, that you take on. Um, and, 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 and of course, risk management can have consequences. And, and to think them through systematically, so, so that we equalize a little bit the attention to different risks and think through all these consequences, that's why we recommend an institutional response, something like a national risk board, so, so that there's a little bit of an oversight of what happens. Um, so, uh, so, so an example of how you can get it wrong is that if you build dikes to, to prevent flooding, but the dikes are a little bit too low, right? You, you encourage house construction behind the dikes. But if they're too low, that all, all those houses will become flooded. So you end up causing more damage eventually. So that's why you need that institutional response. And, 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 and to, to, to Stefan, interesting discussion. 
A lot of it, though, felt like that risk opportunity trade-off that we very much put at the center, and that we, we insist that the flip side of resilience is the opportunity. Resilience cannot be the only goal. It has to be matched with that, uh, that of seeking opportunity. And, but they're complementary because risk management helps people pursue the opportunity. That's what sets them free in a lot of cases, that there is something to fall back on, on. There is a little bit of a safety net. Then they can go forward and move to the city or pursue that education or that investment, what, whatever it is. <coughs> and, um, and, and again, the notion of a hindsight bias and, and this tendency to procrastination, that's why we need to think about ways to institutionalize <coughs> risk management. Don't just leave it to the uh, politicians of the day or to, to people's whims. Think about building some institutions that make it easier to pursue risk management and, and that little bit force yourself and force your systems to, to do it. And in and, term and preparation, uh, does pay off. Um, it the, the the estimates depend very much on what what exactly it is we talk about, and and the estimates are a little bit hard to come up with, as you know. It depends a lot of an, of, on, on assumptions, but but they I mean, so many studies uh, and and we we compared them all show very high payoffs to 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 preparation. Still, it doesn't happen. Donors do not want to fund it, uh, or fund it very little. So, so that's that's really disappointing, and uh, and no, we would like to see much more funding of of uh, of, pre of preparation, including preparation for natural disasters, uh, as well as many other types of risks. So, so let's make make that clear. And and the post 2015, uh, I, we we do believe there should be some kind of resilience goal. Exactly how it should be measured, that that's maybe for another discussion. Great, thanks very much, Carla. Let me make a one general comment and then respond on two very specific things. The general comment, which is something I find very interesting, I'm not sure there's like an obvious answer to it, but it's about the this unknown unknowns and the extent to which you prepare for low probability events. So we, we make a contrast in the report between what happened in Haiti in 2010 and an earthquake in Chile the same year that had a much lower impact, in part because building standards were much more enforced, etc. Now you could say, well, the possibility of that happening in, again in Haiti is very small, so why, why would you prepare for that kind of event again? On the other hand, in 1999, there was a huge cyclone in India. It was the biggest cyclone ever to hit that area. 10,000 people died. Last month, a very similar cyclone hit, Cyclone Phelan, and 15 people died. Now, in 1999, should they not have taken the measures that they did to prepare for a low probability event because the, it might not have happened again? So partly it's a political choice, but for me one of the things I really take away from the report is whether you decide to spend lots and lots of money on in, in expensive infrastructure or not, one thing that's really important is about capacity to respond. And that capacity can be important whether it's a low or high probability event or even for very uncertain events. And I think this is one thing we do say in the report on the unknown <coughs> unknowns. There's a term we call uh, ro robust responses. It's sort of having the capacity, having policies that would work in a wide variety of scenarios, even if they're not ideal in all scenarios. Um, the two specific ones, Tom, I think maybe we can talk afterwards, but I think maybe I uh, went too quickly on the slide. So the slide was on donor disaster funding uh, by category, and the funding for preparation has increased, but is still a, a small um, share of the pie. And I, I would be <coughs> hesitant to say that you get four or five dollars for every one dollar, but many studies do find that preparation is very cost effective. So the point I wanted to make is we need to do even more of it. Uh, and then on the uh, resilience measure, um, I, you know, I think the preparation index that I showed is interesting, but it's also quite simple. I think it, it shows some interesting results, but I wouldn't sort of put my hand in the fire and start allocating older funding based on that. But I, I know that many people are thinking about how to measure resilience. We have a box, box 1.4 in the report that is looking at it. And I think it's a, 
it's a question that's conceptually as well as analytically difficult and you need to decide whether you think of resilience as a capacity, whether you think of resilience as a response only <coughs> to specific events, so it's an ex-post ex measure rather than an ex-ante measure, and whether you think of resilience only to specific risks, so flooding, or as very general risks, which we do. So that box is looking at volatility and income and consumption as one way to measure an aspect of resilience related to capacity in a very general sense to many risks. But it's hard and I know many people are working on that and if it was easy, someone would have come up with a good measure by now. Thanks very much, Kyla. Um, Stefan, can I ask you to hold, yeah. hold Tom's comment for oh, a sure, moment because sure. I've got a couple in of good ones also in from the audience and I want to get one more round um, in from the people in the room as well. From the online audience, from Sheila Page, is there a risk that the World Bank approach demonstrates small c conservatism? All redistribution expropriation creates risk for some, and it should. Um, and a second question from Dom Jonathan Algar, Bright Blue, London. What are the best development case studies for counter-cyclical and sustainable fiscal policy in a risk management context? Specific. Yeah, that is very specific. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, anyone else want to come in now within within the audience? Yeah. Um, my name is Suleiman Ball, and um, I work for the Slamco. I work with um, organizations. I mean, dealing with in development issues. Right. My observation is that. Um, at first, you start that. I mean, you start by saying that the whole, I mean, theme, I mean, surround about surround on poverty, which means more or less the risk management you're talking about is sort of like con conceptualized in the concept in the concept in the context of poverty. But it seems as if along the line, you tend to miss the argument. The whole thing becomes more generalized, right? I mean, it sounds like you're talking about response to humanitarian relief. Rather than, I mean, rather than looking within the context in which the whole risk management you're talking about is surrounded, which is poverty, right? So to me, I don't know exactly, because risk in itself is a very, very complex issue. It's a very, very complex issue, right? I mean, the sooner you tend to generalize it, you tend to miss the way around. So I don't know why you're talking about strategic, strategic vision, right? Within strategic, I mean, strategic cycle, which intertwine with risk in order to achieve your strategic goal, R rather than, I mean, you're talking about risk in itself as a general concept. So which is which? Thank you very much. Another question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I used to work for UNICEF. Can you uh, introduce yourself, please? Oh, I'm Leila, right. and um, for I don't work anywhere right now, so there's nothing more <laughs> else to say. Um, I used to work for UNICEF in the child protection um, section. Um, and that section was comprised of two um, projects. One of them was the legal project, which dealt with children who are uh, mainly in prison right now in Iran. Um, and uh, education of lawyers and judges. Um, so it was basically there was no prevention um, uh, activity defined in that project. And then the other one, the other project was prevention of child abuse project, which was all prevention related activities. And the funding was so little for that um, prevention focused project. Um, and there was so much money for the other project that we were not ab able to spend it. Mm -hmm. um, and after some years, I became so uh, disenchanted by the donor community that I, I just don't see a solution. You know, I don't, I don't have, I've lost all hope. And I was wondering if there has been any shift recently mm. yeah. um, mm. in the donor community's approach, mm. and if there has been any specific donor agency who is more um, proactive in risk management and risk mitigation um, projects right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very mm. much, Leila. It's a okay. great question. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to the panel now and starting with Stefan, but I'd also like to bring, in a way, back to 
uh, Kyla and Rasmus, Alison's challenge about how development instruments need to change in the light of the report, right, the changing sort of landscape of development cooperation. Um, Stefan, would you like to go first? Hmm. Um, I can ask this question on, you, you were asking basically the, the way we were doing disaster responses or humanitarian work, um, whether, because we spend it um, historically always on the responses itself, and not the preparation is what you're saying is kind of the, I'm not sure it's a hindsight bias, whether it, it I, I, I fear it was a, a deliberate policy choice. So, you know, hindsight bias would actually, this kind of the, the important thing is that even if you don't, you make these errors, even if you, uh, even if you're well intentioned and, and and want to do it as a particular policy thing, I think there's a, I think there's a tendency in humanitarians to actually say, well, we improve the information, we set up a general systems, and then we'll start responding where, wherever it happens. Um, but but there is definitely a move now to to do all series of things um, that provide us with trigger points that are much earlier, um, and I'm. Um, and you know, I would argue, argue that say then maybe the rest of the ninety percent of development spending is arguably building up the development, and in that sense, the the, the resilience of, of what we do. But I'll, I'll I'll happily talk offline with you more about it. But the interesting thing I think is that um, where there is progress is to having a much more investment in much earlier information. Uh, there's certain things also ongoing that are actually quite interesting where we trying, and I must be careful uh, since it's not announced to, to say too much, but, but trying to get actually collaborations between, um, to actually create instruments, financial instruments that would start paying out on the basis of forecasts and actually getting monies to come and uh, even maybe the Met Office may well get involved in some of these kind of things. So where we can, you know, much earlier on get a clock ticking and then, you know, you may end up making the resource free, you start starting to do the activity, even if it then turns out that new information says you shouldn't be doing it, you can withdraw it, but actually building in the systems that your responses start first, and then you take the decisions whether you consider cons continue with your responses, and, and process like that. But there's a lot of preparation work, and, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure uh, we would be the first to argue that we're not perfect yet in, in how to organize all these things. Thank you very much, Stefan. Alison. Um, I don't really have a lot more to add. I mean, I want to come back to the to the principles of public action, the five principles that I was um, perhaps unnecessarily rude about. And I, I, don't get me wrong, all these things are good things, but they seem to me to be a great agenda for development. And I was what I was trying to get at was, well, give me something here that really uh, is different in the light of the very rich analysis and um, evidence review that you've done in this report, which sort of takes us further. And what I was struggling to see was, well, you know, this is a classic dilemma for the WDR. It's a it's a policy report, and it's not a an operationalization. You know, it's not an operationalization of bank thinking, not yet anyway. But what will the bank do differently, given that many of these principles are principles that are about good development? So, are we just saying, you know, get on and do good stuff better? Or is there something genuinely different here? And that's what I kind of wanted to see. So that was really where that comment came from. And I think it crystallized for me around the instruments of development engagement. What, what kind of new instrument set are we really looking towards developing in the light of these you know, really genuinely um, sensible <laughs> principles, but ones that don't go quite far enough for me? Just a quick reflection on your example, um, uh, Stefan. Um, about the Indian villages and so forth. Does that include the Palancourt set? Is that no, that's a different no, set. That's a different set. So this is the extra set set. I mean, of course, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Do you th the migration, of course, is an obvious response for many poor families uh, and in rural areas to to risk. But but you're only moving the risk, surely, from one place to another. The risk profile changes possibly, but you're not you know you're not de-risking their livelihood through migration. What you're doing is 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 you know, working with a different profile, possibly, of risk, possible dif different distribution, different intensity. But the fact is, to move from one environment which is highly risky to another, where maybe you have risks along a different, a different spectrum. It, it, my point is that you, you, you know, the idea of there being anything purely risk-free is, is, to my point, you know, rather, rather, a s the wrong starting point. Um, it's how 
you know, in all of these things, you put in place um, uh, responses that 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 that, that, that equalise out the, the risk profile and the opportunities um, that you may want to take. So, I completely agree with 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 most of what you said, Stefan. But I do worry slightly that we develop this notion that people can just get up and pick themselves and move themselves out of an environment, and suddenly you're you know, you, you've, you've, you've dealt with risk, which I know you don't mean, I, but the danger is that some <laughs> might interpret it that but, way. But, but maybe they're not so at the risk of misinterpretation. Or just this, mm. I mean, the point I simply want to make is that um, the, the, the response that people had to their environment, and actually to their poverty, it wasn't to their mm. risk really, to their poverty, was to actually um, take take the opportunities that were offering themselves in India in, it, in an India that started to grow and the opportunities mm -hmm. that were there, and mm -hmm. they took it via non agricultural activities. They didn't try to make the final living. And in fact, I would say definitely. I mean, we could talk about the details of the study, but we have <coughs> a fairly good measure to actually also say that it's con considerably de-risked relative mm -hmm. to to the other livelihoods they had. But also the important thing is that our for, for our discussion here is that when we observe the risk. The, the de-risking of these risks are not necessarily the, the, the solution that actually gives them the best life that, that, that could be had. And it's a bit like we can't, we have to be a bit careful in, in that respect. So there's no disagreement here. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. Kyla. I wanted to say something on the question about how development assistance needs to change. And maybe I'll say what I think and then Rasmus would add or, or disagree. But I think one is about uh, offering different things to different countries. You know, the World Bank traditionally has lent to very poor countries uh, through direct loans, and the world is changing, and the profiles of developing countries are very diverse. Uh, and so I think that the assistance that the bank, but also other institutions can offer, varies according to those. So uh, uh, some risk management assistance might still be in direct loans, but, you know, for example, I think the World Bank has been thinking about technical assistance it might be able to offer to countries like Greece because the World Bank knows a lot about social protection and Greece is having real problems with that. Uh, the second is about uh, the strategic approach that development agencies take in countries. I know that the World Bank <laughs> has, when it, when it works in particular countries, it has a framework for its in engagement, and I'm sure other institutions do. And I think that rather than having only pockets within that framework, there could be much more of an overview of taking risk into account in that framework and not just in specific policies. And then the third thing I would say is on the possibility of new instruments. And, and that's something the, the bank is doing some things on, so it has some Con contingent loan lines, for example, so that if a disaster strikes, you can very quickly have access to money that you'd pre-agreed on. Uh, and then there was a very specific question about uh, fiscal policy, counter-cyclical fiscal policy, good examples of. Uh, that's chapter seven of the report, and you know, it's always risky to say champion of because there's holes in that, but there's a, a nice discussion of Chile and what it's done in terms of counter-cyclical fiscal policy. Thanks very much, Carla. Rasmus. <coughs> great, uh, great discussion. So, so adding to the discussion about a changing aid landscape, I mean, this is not a strategy document, but um, the president of the World Bank is uh, trying to change the institution. He wants us to be more risk-taking. He wants staff to, to pursue risks m to a larger extent. So, 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 so he, he f and that message obviously resonates very well with, with what's, what's in the report. Um, I, I think that development aid can continue to flow into any sector. There's, this is not, there's no statement about some sectors or approaches being more or less important than others. But, uh, but the message is rather to take, take risk management much more seriously. This is the difficult stuff. Maybe that's where the international community should be helping countries do better, rather than do the relatively easy investments that the countries can do on their own anyway. And so how do you, how, how do you <coughs> anchor risk management much more firmly? There are three ways forward. One is if you can put in greater accountability. Can donors create, and, and civil society donors also, create mechanisms of accountability for governments to take risks seriously? Can they come up with data that, that will show light on, on what risk management is not being done? So for example, in, in, in China, uh, better data on air quality leads to then action to reduce that pollution. Of, of the cities, of the air, qu air quality in, in some of the major cities, which is a major risk there. 
So data, providing that data is, is a way of ensuring transparency and accountability. And third, institutional responses, national risk board, fiscal councils, or other bodies that somehow hold, hold government accountable for doing the necessary but difficult long-term uh, actions. Um, it also means changing priorities within <coughs> sectors. Think of something like health, where pandemics, the risk of pandemics is a very real one, and not one that's taken really serious by anyone at the moment. So that would be a, mm. a priority that we would support uh, strongly. Mm. Um, there was a question about expropriation and small c conservatism. Mm. I don't think it's conservative to point to, um, to uh, the risks of government failures and government imposed risks. I mean, a lot of, of, of very progressive civil society organizations work on human rights failures that is predicated on government failures in these countries and trying to address them. Likewise, we're seeing that sort of these random expropriations, which often don't benefit the poor, but benefit the very rich elites and the cronies of, of the leading parties. Let's be clear on that. Um, so so I, I don't think those are good policies of even of, of for anyone to support. And um, uh, th how can civil society organizations get more on, um, on, on, on preparation? And so, so the, the former Prime Minister of Canada, Joe Clark, heard, heard our, our presentation in Montreal. He picked up on this point, and he was urging civil society organizations and, and lobby groups, uh, Rotary and, and organizations like that, to, to try and see if they could fundraise much more specifically for preparation rather than response to specific events. So, so maybe that could be a way to go. But a lot of, of CSOs are, are, are deep into resilience building because it's the logical next step once you've been in the business of responding to disasters in, yeah. in for a long time. Although, I mean, just many thanks to everyone. It's a great discussion. Just the, a closing point is that there is much in the report on the politics of risk management and the political economy of all these things, and that obviously bears on the fact that it's harder to fund child protection or, or you know, prevention, preventative action on child abuse mm. than it is to deal with the aftermath afterwards. So an element definitely of um, this kind of hindsight bias is about the way the politics works mm. and that's probably the most intractable and difficult, difficult element to get at. But anyway, that was a great discussion. Sorry we overran slightly, but many thanks to all of the Thank panellists, to Rasmus, to Kyla, to Alison and Stefan. And thanks for all your questions as well. Thank you.